And this morning, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, in this short passage, let's just read both of these verses together. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Thank you very much. You may be seated. Our Heavenly Father, we come now to you and as, as your children in great need. We have no one in heaven besides you. There's not a saint we can pray to. There's not a person we can talk to. Only you. And I would ask you now, dear Heavenly Father, as your children, we would ask you to meet the needs that are here today. Help us to grow. Help us, Lord, that we might have our lives touched by the word of God. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The message this morning is simply entitled, God Forbid. Look at Romans 6, 1 one more time. The question is posed, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, if indeed grace abounds because of the revelation of sin in our lives, then why is it wrong to continue in sin? I mean, think about that. It said, in sin, it said grace abounds. So why is it wrong to continue in sin? Some religious groups, the Mormons in particular, are very thankful and grateful for man's fall into sin because they say that it allowed for the manifestation of God's grace. I want to be honest and say, I, as thankful as I am for the grace of God, I wish sin had never abounded. And I mean that with all of my heart. Adam and Eve had it made, but God's grace, of course, was there. Paul gives a very straightforward answer to the question that is posed in Romans 6 and verse 1. And if you look again at verse 2, it says, God forbid. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The term God forbid that God put here, and as you know, every word in the Bible is there with purpose and on purpose. There's nothing in there by accident, nothing in there by happen chance. But here it's a very strong term that God uses here. And it simply means by no means may it never be. <laughs> in other words, what a ridiculous thought. A rhetorical question nonetheless. Shall we continue in sin? God forbid. No way. It shouldn't happen. And God was very emphatic about that. The Bible says in verse 2 that we are dead to sin. I think a term misunderstood by many. But it simply means that we are dead to its eternal wage, which is death and hell. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Because a saved person never has to worry about the dangers of hellfire. This poses a problem with many religious groups because they say that it simply means that you now have a license to sin. Because you never have to worry about hell ever again. Well, it has nothing to do with a license to sin. And just because you're saved does not give you the freedom to live in sin or as you please. It just doesn't give that freedom. It's not part of it. Even though that's what many people choose to do, that doesn't mean that you have a license to do so. You see, before salvation, we were dead spiritually in trespasses and sins. And that's absolutely the truth. That salvation, we were made alive to God. It also means that in salvation, we died to sin. Now, what does that mean? That is, we died to the law of sin and death. That's what we died to. You see, 57 years ago, when an eight-year-old boy trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, he was set free from that penalty. Amen. The wages of sin is death, but I don't have to go to hell. Thank God for that. And I've had a faithful God who has watched over me for these 57 years uh, that I have known him as my Savior. But it did not give me a license to sin, even though there were times that I took a license to sin, just like many of you have done. And the reason I said that is because I don't want any of you looking at me with that sanctimonious holier-than-thou look, okay? So just so that you know, we're all in the same boat, all righty? Don't, don't forget that. And it means that at salvation, we died to that penalty. You see, salvation set us free from hell forever. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, For the law of the spirit of life uh, in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. When I got saved, I became eternally secure. I am not kept by my power. I'm not kept by my righteousness. I am not kept by my dedication. I'm not even kept by my faith. The Apostle Peter, who was one of the biggest backsliders in the word of God that we ever knew, cursed and swore, quit the ministry, took men with him. 
denied his Savior, and he said we're kept by the power of God. Amen. That means a great deal to me. And so I've been set free uh, from that law of sin and death. Now, because you are truly born again, you ought to learn to live a life that's consistent with your justification. God declares us righteous, and it is our privilege to live like we are, like we are saved. That's what we're supposed to do. You see, we're part of his family. James said it plainly. He said, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. James said, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So your, your salvation ought to match your lifestyle. And your lifestyle ought to match, I should say in this order, your lifestyle ought to match your salvation. You see, he says that faith without works is dead and your walk should back up your talk and your profession should back up your possession. You need to act like you're one of God's own. You need to live like you're one of God's own. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not something that happens naturally. At the point of salvation, you receive God's gift of eternal life. Thank God for the gift of eternal life. Thank God for salvation. And by the way, thank God it's a gift. And a gift is something somebody else paid for. It's not something you pay for. It's something somebody else paid for. You simply, you simply receive that gift by grace through faith, as the word of God says. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We have that gift, praise the Lord. But, you know, this is something that you have to choose clearly, as it's stated in the word of God, if you're going to live that Christian life. It's your choice. It's your choice. There is a belief today that says you're eternally secure because you'll never walk away from it. If you walk away from it, you were never saved to begin with. Well, that's kind of silly. The Bible doesn't teach that even close, right. you see. But listen to what the Word of God does say. Now, I want you to remember this. The Apostle Paul is writing to a bunch of believers. He is not writing to a bunch of unsaved people that need to make Jesus the Lord of their lives mm -hmm. in order to be saved. He's not writing to a bunch of unsaved people. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Jewish brethren, saved brethren, but brethren nonetheless. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Stop right there. Let me just say it again. What are the mercies of God? Romans 1 through 11. You want to know what the mercies of God consist of? Read Romans 1 through 11 and you'll find the painstaking detail that God went to and through to bring salvation to a bunch of Gentile unbelievers like ourselves. Right. And that's what Paul said in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, brethren, by those mercies that I just taught you about in 11 chapters, 11 glorious chapters. He says, by those mercies, I beseech you by the mercies of God. And then he says to these believers that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. It doesn't sound like they made their bodies a living sacrifice in order to get saved. It sounds like these Roman believers needed to make their bodies a living sacrifice in order to make their walk and their talk match. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. Apparently there was a problem, sounds like today, of many Christians being conformed to this world. Wow. Allowing the world to squeeze them into its own mold. And he says, and apparently there was a problem. That's why he said, now you need to give your body a sacrifice to him. And then he says, holy, that's not W-H-O-L-L-Y. That's holy. H-O-L-Y, separated, set apart for him. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now listen carefully. Again, I've said this to you before. That's not three wills of God. I think it's kind of funny. Somebody says, well, I'm not a perfect will, so I must be in God's acceptable will. Have you ever heard anybody say they're in God's good will? No, you haven't, unless that's where they shop. Because many goodwills are run by Christian people. Don't miss this. Good, acceptable, and perfect describe one thing, the will of God. That's it. Not acceptable, not good, not perfect, but good, acceptable, and perfect. All of that describing one thing, the will of God. 
And he says, the way you do that is to give your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And again, let me go back. And I know that Greek doesn't mean anything to anybody hardly anymore today, but every word in the Bible is there with a purpose. The word reasonable is the word for logic in the Greek language. He said, this is the only logical thing for you to do. Considering everything that God did for you in Romans 1 through 11, he said, the only logical thing for you to do is to give yourself back to him and serve him with all of your heart. Now, that just makes good sense to me. I got saved at eight. I did not dedicate my life to serve the Lord until I was 17. And I'm glad that I did. Getting saved does not make you dedicated. Getting saved makes you saved. The rest of it's growth, you see. And so uh, the obvious answer, uh, listen, the obvious answer is this. is something that you got to choose. It's clearly stated. And listen, the obvious answer is, God forbid, with that in mind, I'd like to ask you some similar questions. God does not want us to continue in the life that we came from. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says very simply, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creature. Oh, a new creation, something brand new, something that God is putting together. And he says, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And in our Christian life, things ought to be becoming new. Old things ought to be passing away. All things ought to be becoming new. That's the way it's supposed to be in our Christian life. And we're supposed to be growing that way. But some Christians come along fast and other Christians don't come along fast at all. And what I'm saying is, is it doesn't mean they're not saved. It simply means that they're not coming along as fast. And if I were to ask all of you in this room this morning a simple question, if I were to say, how many of you on the very day that you got saved dedicated your entire life to everything to the Lord and stuck with it for all these years? My guess is not one hand would go up. And the reason is, is because we have a fall in human nature that loves to go backwards. So for whatever the reason is, we love to go back to the old things. And the Apostle Paul said, well, just because grace has abounded, does that mean you should continue in sin? And then he said these words, God forbid. Now, the questions I want to ask you are these. Number one, if you're taking notes, I have 27 points. We won't get out till three <clears throat> or four. Nope. Number one, shall we continue in the willful commission of sin? Shall we continue in the willful commission of sin? You know, as long as you are human, that's how I feel. That's how I feel right now. It was the announcement of that four o'clock sermon that got them all upset. I can out-preach any child, but I can't out-cute them, so that's okay. That's just the way it goes. Okay. Now listen carefully, now that that's out of the way. As long as you are human, you will never be sinless. But because you are a Christian, every day that you live, you ought to sin less. And that's the way it's supposed to be. You are supposed to be, do better every single day. You're not supposed to be the same as you were. Why? Because all things have become new. And God wants our lives to be changed. And I think it's interesting. We usually stop at 2 Corinthians 5.17. But we shouldn't. We should read on to verse 21, where the word of God plainly says and simply says, it says, for he, God the Father, hath made him the Son to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the, what? Righteousness of God in him. God wants our lives to be changed and different. He, as the songwriter said, he didn't bring us this far to leave us. And he didn't bring us up to let us down. And he didn't build a home in us just to move away. And the interesting thing about that is he wants us to continue to grow. You see, sadly, many Christians take their eternal salvation and use it as a license to continue in sin because they never have to worry about eternal hell fire. And eternal security of the believer is not a license to sin. It's just a promise from God. I will keep you saved. Peter was saved. He walked away from the Lord and he came back. That didn't mean he was lost. No wonder he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we are kept by the power of God. Because he knew that he couldn't keep himself saved. You are not saved by grace and kept by your own righteousness. You're saved by grace and kept by the power of God. 
And the sooner we understand that, we must understand that is not a license to sin. What a great blessing that is that he chooses to keep us saved. A few years ago, there was a young man that I had the privilege of leading to faith in Christ. I found out just in the last week that he passed away right here uh, in Colorado, in Manitou Springs. Did he live a righteous life? No. And when he got to heaven to meet his Lord, he, uh, I'm sure that there was some disappointment there. No wonder there's tears in heaven. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But that did not mean he was any less saved. It just meant that he was less dedicated. And just like some of us on our bad days, and aren't you glad others don't judge us on our bad days? Another thing I've said a hundred dozen times, our children backslide and we wonder if they're saved. We backslide and we just tell them we're going through a phase. That doesn't even make sense. I'd doubt your salvation before I'd doubt theirs. Something in the Bible about children's faith is a lot, it says a lot. But what I'm simply saying is this. You know, it doesn't mean you're going to live for God every day of your life. And I don't care what the soothsayers say and all the false teachers have to say about that. I asked a guy one time who did not believe in eternal security, and I said, what sin do you have to commit to where God will no longer keep you saved? I've never had anybody ever answer that question. Except for one Baptist group, they said you can choose not to believe anymore and give it back to God and he will let you go. I'd like somebody to show me that in scripture, please. Right. right. It just, I'm sorry, it just ain't there. That's Tennessean vernacular, meaning it ain't there. You see, I, I really believe with all of my heart, but the Apostle Paul, when he says, shall, shall we continue in sin? He's asking, are you going to continue this willful sin, sinfulness in your life? God forbid, he said. But secondly, number two, shall we continue in the denial of sin? Shall we continue in the denial of sin? First John chapter 1 and verse 10, the Bible says this, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I was witnessing to a fellow just this week that had come by the church and uh, we were standing back here in the office and we were chatting. And uh, I said, well, do you have a church where you, uh, where you live? He said, well, yes, I do. I go to such and such church, but I've not been there in a year. Well, it was a Baptist church. So my next question is naturally, well, are you a saved Baptist? Because not all Baptists are saved, in case you're wondering. Being Baptist doesn't make you a Christian any more than walking into right. Dunkin' right. Donuts makes you a police officer. <laughs> His answer was certainly not super positive that he was born again. He had been asked to be a deacon. He had been asked to serve throughout the church, all kinds of things, but unsure of his salvation. I believe they'll come down one of these days and visit us here. At least that's what my hopes are. But the thing is, if we say that we have not sinned, now you talk to somebody and uh, are, are, we're all sinners. Well, I'm not, a, I'm not nearly as bad as so-and-so. I don't push old men down steep hills in wheelchairs. You know, I've never murdered anybody. I don't rob banks. We give all these silly excuses that people never do. But they, the truth of the matter is we're all sinners. And we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're born that way. Even the Old Testament says you come out of the womb telling lies. And boy, don't we know that's true. You don't have to teach a child how to lie. You can only teach him how to do it more efficiently. But you don't have to teach him how to lie. By the way, pride is the biggest factor. Many believers are not willing to call sin what it is. And of course, it is all, it, it, it's always sin in someone else's life, but many are not willing to call it sin in their own lives. Maybe just shortcomings, maybe weaknesses, maybe having a bad day, maybe I'm tired. I'm not even going to ask you how many of you are tired today. Yes, I am. How many of you are tired today? My hand is up. So you're all a bunch of sinners not willing to admit that you just got a bad attitude. You know that stuff that says, I'm not any good to talk to till I've had my coffee? <laughs> oh. Or I'm not a morning person. I'll, I'll give you time to discuss this with one another if you'd like. Okay, are you done discussing it now? I thought so. Or I have red hair or I'm German, or pardon my French, or I was raised in a bad family. 
one preacher that I knew in Indianapolis, he gave one of the best statements. He's in heaven now. Well, as I was listening to him preach, he said, every churn has to sit on its own bottom. And I caught it right away, what he said. In other words, every one of us are responsible for every one of our actions. And we can't keep blaming it on something else. Right. And it's very interesting. You see, it makes no difference. Uh, we're all sinners. And to deny that fact is simply wrong. So shall we continue in the denial of sin? The Apostle Paul says what? God forbid. Don't say you're not as bad as somebody. The truth of the matter is you may not be as bad as somebody, but you're still a sinner, just like all the rest of us are. The ground at the foot of the cross is completely level, and we need to remember that. Number three, shall we continue in our justification of sin? Shall we continue in our justification of sin? Justification is one of those words that books have been written about, but after you boil all the fat off of it, all it simply means is this. You declare it right. When God justified me, he declared me righteous. Write any book you want to, that's the bottom line. It, he declared me righteous. But a many today justify their sin by declaring it not all that bad or saying, I didn't do anything wrong, you see. The Bible says this in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. There's a woe that is written here. It says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Now, I know many of you are calling, you're thinking about our government right now, but I'm not preaching about our government. I'm talking about the crowd sitting in this room today and the ones listening online at home. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, and put darkness for light and light for darkness, and put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And there are many believers today who justify their sinfulness by saying it's not all that bad or I didn't do anything wrong or as young people will say to their parents, what's wrong with it? We justify our acts of sin in any way that we want to declare that it's righteous. You see, we say of other people that they have no excuse, but for us there is always an excuse or a reason that we do wrongly. We always have a reason. You know, perhaps it's because of a brother or a sister or a mom or a dad or some spouses blame their sins on each other uh, while others blame their environment and others are set of circumstances and the job they hold. And if it wasn't for my wife or it wasn't for my husband or if it wasn't for my parents, if it weren't uh, for the situation that I'm in, then my life would be different. Justify it any way you want to. It's still wrong, you see. So I can't help it. There was no love in my home growing up. All right, then change that in your home. Decide you're going to love. Say, well, in my home, I did this growing up, and there was no love between my parents and me. All right, then be different. In the Bible, there's a fellow that's one of my very favorite, one of my very favorite individuals. He came from a horrible family and became a great king. Very amazing thing. And he didn't blame any. He just had people that influenced him right. And he became a wonderful king that God used in a wonderful way. And today we say, well, I can't do this because this is the home. My mom and dad were divorced. My, great my grandparents were divorced. My great-grandparents were divorced. There were drunks in my family. There were horse thieves in my family. There were worldly people in my family. There were bank robbers in my family. And I guess I am just predestined to be that way. Oh, phooey. Phooey is a Greek term. And it means you, somebody sold you a, a wooden nickel. You don't have to be that way because your family was. Amen, and I'm so, in my, own, in my own pastoral spirit, I'm so tired of hearing Christians blame how they are on how they were reared. As an adult, when our children blame their wrongdoing on their friends, what do parents do? You made a choice. Don't blame that on your friends. You made a choice. But when we do wrongly and start blaming it on our pasts, then that's how we justify our own sin. And we should not do that. You see, if sin is sin and sin is wrong, then wrong should never be declared as right. I'm going to say that again because I think it's important. If sin is sin and sin is wrong, then wrong should never be declared right. It should never be justified. Shall we continue to justify our sin? The Apostle Paul says, God forbid. Number four of 27. 
Number four, shall we continue in the curiosity of sin? This is a hard one for so many. The old saying says that curiosity kills cats. Aren't you glad you're not a cat? Because the truth of the matter is it would kill a lot of us, wouldn't it? Some people continue in sin because they feel that they can. Others continue in sin because they are simply curious. And I have to be honest and say, I've never wanted to know what it's like to be drunk. I've never wanted to know what it's like to be diseased with some STD. I've never wanted to know what it's like to be high. I've never wanted to know what it's like to be low with those other drugs. I've never been curious about being perverted. I've never been curious about being immoral. Are you listening to me? I've never been curious about being crooked. Oh, what would it be like to go rob the bank? What would it be like to get involved in immorality? I don't, I don't have any desire for that. See, when I was a little boy, my parents taught me that some things were wrong, and I was just smart enough as a little kid to believe them. And as an adult, I still believe them. Both of my parents are in heaven today, and they know this is a true statement. That's not a curiosity that I want to be part of. Shall we continue in the curiosity of sin? God forbid. Number five, shall we continue in the experimentation of sin? Shall we continue in the, exper in the experimentation of sin? How many times do you have to experiment in something before it blows up in your face? The prophet Ezekiel said these words, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. In fact, he said it twice. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's a pretty plain statement, isn't it? And Romans 8, 6 says this, For to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So God makes these statements, and think about that. That means, oh, well, then I want to experiment with it and see if God is actually right. No, God is right, and the Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. I had a cousin uh, who's now, um, he passed away a number of years ago. He, um, he wanted to try out a new beer, so he told me about it. He said, I got me a new beer, and he says, I drank an entire 12-pack before I decided I didn't like it. And I got to thinking, how stupid. Number one, wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. That's hard to get around in the Bible. But so many people today, they say, well, I know God says this is wrong, but I'm going to just see how bad it is and then I'll make a decision then. No, don't be experimenting with it. Not a good thing to do. And my mom and dad taught me when I was growing up, you play with fire, you'll get burned. One time I made the mistake of going to a petting zoo. Why was it a mistake? Because the animals bit you? No, because I scratched a goat's head and my hand smelled like a goat the rest of the day. And I thought, yuck, and it didn't smell good. And a goat does not smell good unless he's been bathed regularly. I may know what I'm talking about. Of course you do. If you've ever been to a petting zoo and you petted the animals and you came home stinking just like the animals? Well, that's what happens when you experiment with sin. You come away with something that has affected you. Right. And it does, by the way. Shall we continue in the experimentation of sin? God forbid. Number six, and we've done shortly. Shall we continue in the enjoyment of sin? I heard a preacher one time say, sin's not enjoyable. And I thought, you've not read your Bible, sir. The word of God says this in Hebrews 11 and verse 25. Of Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. In other words, there were things about backsliddenness and wrongness that would be pleasurable to the flesh. So for a preacher to say that sin is not fun or pleasurable is a, is a foolish statement to make. Because the Bible says that it's pleasurable. But that doesn't mean that it's right. One of the great appeals of sin is the apparent happiness that it brings. I've never been drunk, but people tell me that it's fun. I've uh, never been high, but people tell me that it's fun. I've never been low like that, but people tell me that it's fun. I've never been perverted, but people tell me that that's fun. I've never been immoral in my life, but people tell me that that's fun. I've never been crooked in my life, but people tell me that that's fun. But that doesn't mean that it is. Because the Bible says, in the end, it biteth like an adder. It's full of poison. And it will... Kind of, and I've given this illustration before, and people usually laugh at it, but now they just kind of go, hank, because they've heard it too many times. But it's like the fellow that fell off the 10th floor of a building. 
halfway down, somebody heard him say, everything's okay so far. <laughs> yeah, but there's a stop at the bottom that's a killer every time. And that's just it. Well, I'm not living for God and, and nothing has happened to me yet. The, the, the key word there is the word yet. God does not allow his children to get away with things, you see. Any more than a loving parent would allow his children to get away with things. Sin may bring a pleasure at the start, but in the end, Proverbs twenty three thirty two. I quoted it a moment ago. It biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. It biteth like a serpent and it stingeth like an adder. It's got a poisonous bite. Shall we continue in the enjoyment of sin? The Apostle Paul says, God forbid. Number seven, shall we continue in the memory of sin? The memory of sin, Pastor? Yes, the memory of sin. The Apostle Paul said, it's be said it best when he said that he needed to forget the things that were behind and to reach forth to those things which were before. It's best to leave the past in the past and leave it there. Only grace and time will care for the memory of sin. I want to read for you an illustration that I used many, many years ago, found it in my files. It's like the little boy who was naughty all the time, so his father decided to drive a nail into a door every time the little boy was naughty. He promised to remove every nail every time that he was obedient and good. But those times were much fewer than the bad times. One day the door was filled with nails. And the thought of, the, of this broke the little boy's heart. So he de his dad promised to remove a nail every time the boy did what was right, but promised to put a nail back in every time the boy was disobedient and naughty. Well, this time it was different. He tried his best to get the nails removed from the door, and occasionally another nail was driven into the door. He tried so hard, and finally the father noticed that the door was empty of nails. So he showed his son the door, and how good he had been. And when the young man saw the door, he started to cry. His father asked him, why are you crying? The nails are gone. And the son replied, yes, daddy, the nails are gone. But the holes are still there. You see, that memory of sin. I can't serve God because of how it was in the past. I wonder why the Apostle Paul said to those Roman believers, holy, acceptable under God. I wonder why he said, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Why? Because they hadn't done that. Many of them had passed. And by the way, the only thing God has to use down here are a bunch of sinners. That's it. Doesn't have anybody else. A bunch of broken vessels is what we are. God uses broken things. He really does. And sin, by the way, is the same way. It leaves a memory that's hard to lose, but it can be lost by the grace of God. The Bible says that God has removed our sins from his memory. Isn't that a wonderful blessing? You say, well, you mean God forgets stuff on purpose. It's something God chooses to do. And when David confessed his sin with Bathsheba, he never mentioned the sin of adultery to God. He confessed it and forsook it and was forgiven by God. It just doesn't do any good to dredge up the past. It just doesn't. It didn't do you any good then. It's not going to do you any good now. Now, the Bible says we need to remember the pit from whence we're digged, and I think that's important. But we need to thank God that we're not what we once were. As I've said over and over again, the past is a wonderful place to visit from time to time, but it's not a good place to live. In my home, uh, we have thousands of slides that we've taken over the year, and I don't thousands of photographs. We got photo albums all over downstairs if you were to go into the downstairs office in our home and and you were to look in that office on the shelf there there's just boxes and boxes of slides and every one of them contains hundreds of slides and then there are photo albums that just contain literally thousands of pictures on occasion I'll take those out and look at them but I don't live in my past because I'm alive right now my people don't need me 20 years ago they need me today my family does not need me 40 years ago. They need me today. And you don't need to be living in your past either of how it used to be. Just remember that you're not there anymore. You see, shall we continue in the memory of sin? Well, God forbid. Number eight, and lastly, shall we continue in the guilt of sin? Shall we continue in the guilt of sin? Absolutely not. 
God forbid. If you've been forgiven, it's been forgotten. Don't forget that. If you've been forgiven, it's been forgotten. You see the holes in the door. You understand the scars are still there. Yes, but God has removed it from his memory. A man, may, a man kept bringing up his already forgiven sins to the Lord, and the songwriter put it this way. What, song, what sins are you talking about? Gone, 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 gone. Yes, my sins are gone. Now my soul is free, and in my heart's a song. Buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. Now I'm saved eternally, praise God, my sins are G-O-N-E, gone. We teach that to the children, but why don't we believe it ourselves? Right. You see, the Bible says in Jeremiah thirty-one thirty-four, he remembers our sins no more. I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. And Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25 says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and I will not remember thy sins. Not only that, but he's buried our sins in the depths of the sea, Micah 7, 19. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Isaiah 38 and verse 17, it says that he placed our sins behind his back. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins. Oh, thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. And then the Bible says in Psalm 103 and verse 12 that he's removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. If you go east on a straight line, you'll never find west. If you go west on a straight line, you'll never find the east. And it says as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. That's a lot of forgiveness. So you don't need to be living under the guilt of your past anymore. You need to just let it go and let God have control of your life right now, today. To be forgiven by God means that God no longer holds you in debt for your sin. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the wages of sin is death. But when I'm forgiven, I'm no longer under that penalty. I don't have to go to hell. He's forgiven me. Now, the law was introduced to mankind in order to show the need for a savior. The law was never introduced for men to keep because God knew that they couldn't keep it. But it showed them their need for a savior. And when, when man knew that he had sinned, he found that he needed grace. And Paul said, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And should we continue in that sin that grace may continue to abound? God forbid. What is it about sin that you continue in? Are you continuing in the willful commission of sin? the denial of sin, the justification of sin, the curiosity of sin, the experimentation of sin, the enjoyment of sin, the memory of sin, the guilt of sin, God forbid. So what's the answer? Is there an answer? And with this I close. The answer is what shall we do, Paul said. Shall we continue in sin? He said, God forbid, but that's not the end of it. Romans 12, 1 and 2 once again says this. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I got saved at eight. Thank God I did. First time I ever heard the gospel and understood it was then. When that preacher gave that invitation in that service on that Sunday night in that midwinter revival, and I looked up at my dad, and I said, Daddy, I need to go get saved. And he put his hand on my, my dad was lost at that time. He put his hand on my back and patted me and said, Go on, son. And I walked down that aisle that to an eight-year-old boy was about five miles long. And I walked down that aisle, and the preacher took me by the hand and asked me why I was there. I told him I wanted to get saved. And he motioned like this to Ben Conrad on this side of the auditorium. And Ben came up and sat down with me in a room just to the left of the, of the uh, platform of the church. And I sat down in that little gray-green folding chair along with my brother and a couple of other young boys. And Ben Conrad took his old Bible. It didn't have gilded edges like this Bible. It had the coppered edges. You've seen them before. 
And he sat down with his Bible, and he showed us how to receive Christ as Savior. And on that night, this little eight-year-old boy received Jesus as his Savior. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But I've not been the Christian that I ought to be for all these 57 years. But it wasn't until I was 17 years of age that I walked down that aisle in that our church had built a new auditorium. And Brother Penn, you've been in that church auditorium with me. And I remember I was sitting right over here, about three rows back. And I stepped out and I walked down and I knelt right here to the right, uh, to your right and my left of the pulpit. Nobody dealt with me. Nobody came and prayed with me. But I got on my knees and I said to the Lord, I'm, giving, I'm writing you a blank check. Spiritually, I wrote God a blank check. And then I signed it. And I said, Lord, you fill it out for whatever you want. I didn't know what God wanted for me. I didn't know if I was going to be a preacher or a bathroom cleaner. I didn't know if I was, I'm glad I'm not a bathroom cleaner. Spray bottles I would never fit. But, uh, but I, I'd be somebody that washed windows or, or drove a bus or was a deacon or a sound man or an usher. I didn't know what God wanted for me to be because I just said, Lord, whatever you want, that's fine. I just wrote that check out and I signed it at the bottom and I got up and I went back to my seat. Never knew what God had for me. But God's been awfully gracious to me. But I want to say this. I may have dedicated my life at 17 and I never went back on that promise. But I've not been the Christian that I ought to be. Because there's a few things that I continued in. But God has been forgiving. And I thank the Lord for where he's brought me to today. Now, if you in this room have never in your life ever had a time where you got on your face before God and you said, Lord, you can have all of me, lock, stock, and barrel. I can't think of a better time than now because you'll never be sorry. There was a young lady in our church in Missouri when I was a youth director there. Oh, man, she was a rebel. You could read it in her eyes. And you know, you really could. And it was all over her. And at camp one year, she and another friend who were both Two of the biggest rebel girls in the entire camp as teenagers. One day, God got a hold of her heart, just shook her, shook her, and broke her. And she got on her face before God and got right with the Lord. Well, she's now a pastor's wife and serving the Lord in another state and been serving the Lord for all these years. Thank the Lord for that. But every year for the longest time, she would send me a card in the mail. And all the card said was, Dear Pastor Dan, it's been this many years. No regrets. Amen. No regrets. Yeah. Boy, I tell you what, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Amen. Still serving the Lord, by the way, faithful at it, and had every opportunity to quit, her and her husband, but they haven't. And all I'm saying is this, no better time than the present than to do it. Because God wants all of us, not part of us. He wants the whole shooting match, as my dad used to call it, the whole shooting match. And you'll never be sorry. It'll not always be a smooth road, but it'll always be the right road. My church family finished the phrase for me. The right road always leads where? To the right place. The right road always leads to the right place. And if you're on the wrong road, it will lead you where? To the wrong place. So the best thing to do if you're on the wrong road is to get on to the right road because the right road will take you to the right place. I want to thank